It's time again to open the phones, texts, and emails. We take all of your medical questions. It's Ask Us Anything, tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Health information based on science, built on trust. Hello, I'm Dr. Deborah Johnston, tonight's Prairie Doc. This season we continue to bring our viewers trusted health information from doctors and health professionals within your own communities. Thank you for joining us again. Tonight we are hosting one of my favorite shows and the viewers too, Ask the Prairie Doc, where viewers get to ask any medical question. Joining us in the studio tonight in Brookings are Dr. Samantha Darnell from Sanford Health in Watertown and Dr. Comfort Agaba from the Avera Medical Group Internal Medicine in Sioux Falls. Welcome, ladies. I am so thrilled to have you. This is going to be so much fun. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Proud to be here. Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Darnell, you have a special connection to the Prairie Doc. Why don't you tell our viewers who maybe didn't get to see the season wrap up last season what your connection with the show is? My connection with the show is Dr. Rick Holm was my godfather. Yep, I knew him from my first breath essentially. We met right after I was born and had a wonderful connection all through our lives and boy I sure miss him but I am more than tickled to be here on his original show. I'm very, very honored to be here. A dream come true for me, really. <laughs> so I, I appreciate you inviting me. I really do. I'm so thrilled to have you. And, and what, is your, what is your background? I am a family medicine physician. I grew up here in Brookings. This is where I'm from originally. Born and raised along with my parents. They own Madari Acres down the road. So we're born and bred. Um, went to Luther College for undergrad, then master's degree at USD, and then Ross University in the Caribbean for my medical school degree. Then spent some time in Chicago, then three years in Sioux Falls for residency, and now I'm in Watertown practicing family medicine with OB. So I'm literally very happy doing it all. In doing it all, <laughs> to say the least. Yes. Yes. Dr. Agaba, tell us about your background. Yes, yeah, so I am fortunate to be in Sioux Falls today, but I've traveled a long ways to be here. So I did medical school in Nigeria. Um, I came to the U.S. to do a master's in public health. I did that in Connecticut. It was a state university. I worked at Yale University doing research uh, for a bunch of years. Uh, I went back to do residency in New York State. And I picked my first job after residency doing internal medicine with Avera Medical Group, and that's how come I'm in Sioux Falls today. So at least the weather today with all the snow, having lived in New York, yes. is not totally alien to you. No, so, no. It snows so, in Connecticut, it snows in New yes. York. <laughs> so, so we can trust that yeah. you are probably not going to decide that you can't cope with this weather anymore oh, and, no. and take off. So no, I no. tail it away. So <laughs> fabulous. Yeah, so you. we have two family practice doctors and an internal medicine doctor here. So I like to play Stump the Prairie Docs. So uh, mm. send us your Great. questions. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you know what happens sometimes. Yeah. Our viewers have, have managed to stump us before. Oh um, but, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity for people to ask whatever is on their mind, whatever they would like to know a little bit more about. Um, so send us in some questions, people. Yeah. So we invite you, our audience, to submit your questions. Viewers can contact us three ways. Call 1-888-376-6225. Send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org or ask on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. We will work to answer as many of your questions as possible given the time we have available. Sometimes we receive more questions than we can cover, and we apologize if we don't get to your question. To encourage you to ask early, so we're more likely to get to your question, all questions asked in the first 20 minutes will be entered into a Prairie Doc, into a drawing for one of our Prairie Doc gift items. The winner will be announced at the end of the program. Your question will remain anonymous, but 
please provide contact information when you submit your question so we can get you your prize. So we're going to have some questions here from our viewers, and this is this is the fun part. So, uh, and I think this is a, a really large uh, oversight question. And Dr. Agaba, with your background in public health and community health, I'm going to address this one to you because I think this is uh, particularly appropriate. There, what do you think the most pressing medical issue is? facing healthcare in the US today? So, <laughs> Sounds like, yeah. <laughs> so we, we are probably past the point where infectious diseases was like the only thing that the world talked about. I know we just went through this scare with, you know, COVID and new infections coming in, but cardiovascular diseases is still yeah. the bigger thing now. Um, so some people say, oh, excess nutrition. Some people still say, you know, kind of call it, um, you know, poor nutrition. And we're having issues just trying to figure that into the whole system. So um, in the past, smoking was considered like the worst thing for a heart attack. Ironically now, just having high cholesterol is a really big problem. Unfortunately, some people are born with it. So no matter what you do, you you know you do all the exercising, you do all the healthy eating, you may still need help getting those numbers down to cut down the risk for stroke or heart attack. So I would tend to say that is still plaguing us today. Yeah. And I would say that that doesn't mean you have carte blanche to start smoking. <laughs> smoking sorry. is still bad for you it people. Don't bad. do it. Come get it help quitting. <laughs> but uh, but it's yeah. not the only it's contributing the only. factor it's that only. we need to yeah. consider. And so. the combination is really is bad. Really bad. So you smoke and you have high cholesterol. It's like diabetes, a walking high time blood ball. pressure. Yeah, yep. with yep. all those exactly. Things. Yeah. Sam, do you want to? take a shot at what your thoughts are about what the biggest problem is from your perspective? I, I couldn't agree more with you, but I, I also think one thing that gets shoved to the back burner is mental health mm. issues recently. Mm. Many exacerbated by the pandemic, mm. people being you know, shoved into their home, some against their will, not even going into work on a daily basis. I think that seclusion has really taken a toll on us. And then you add everything else into it and it's it's really, really getting tough out there so I'll just put a plug in there that if, if people are struggling please reach out to your physician and tell them you're having a hard time the, it, it, you're not the only one and, and I need people to know that that's what we're here for mm -hmm. so if you're having a hard time do not feel alone because this everybody's having a really tough time so change is hard and there have been so many stresses in the yes. past a decade in particular, um, but definitely exacerbated by the pandemic that it is it is hard for everybody. And I would say one of our biggest challenges is just access, oh. having having Jeez. the personnel mm -hmm. to help the people who need help, mm -hmm. particularly with the crises and the increased needs that oh, we've had, yeah. both medical, yeah, mental. mental health, yeah. physical health mm -hmm. uh, has mm -hmm. been a big deal yeah. for us well, lately. Yeah, so, perfectly said. Mm -hmm. oh boy, we're getting lots of questions already. This is wonderful. Okay, um, we have a caller from White River who is looking for suggestions on preventing falls in the elderly. Mm -hmm. And internal medicine doctors mm -hmm. are definitely the elderly uh, <laughs> elderly gurus. Oh, so yes. yeah. what, uh, what mm -hmm. advice do you have, Dr. Agaba? So, you know, the thing is just think about the whole person, right? So what would make someone fall? As they get older, most of those um, senses that keep mm -hmm. in touch with the outside mm -hmm. world may start to have changes. So if they have cataract and their vision yes. is altered, yes. you know, they may not know it. They're like, it feels like a curtain. It feels like this, it feels like that. They may not be able to perceive depth and know like the stairs is this far or this near. Yes. If they can't hear, a lot of times we have balance issues having something to do with the ears. And then of course, fancy, you know, the weak bones with the osteoporosis, the osteopenia, and simple things like cords on the floor, carpet not placed in place, you know. So everything, you know, 
as simple as it sounds, just trying to figure out basic, going to the room, take a look. Is there like something with a jagged edge? Is there something that is a trip hazard? Is there something that makes them dehydrated? They've been out in the sun longer than they should be. Is there something that affects their sleep, makes them sleep too much or keeps them awake all night and they're drowsy at the wrong time? We're looking at the total person. Mm -hmm. So fall risks are anything at all with the elderly and having a conversation with them checking those things out you know and maybe not blaming them sometimes mm -hmm. would encourage them to be more forthcoming when they start to have those mm -hmm. challenges but yes it's a great question it is a great question yeah thank you i i like to recommend uh, physical therapy yes. for a lot Love of those yeah. folks yeah. because mm -hmm. that balance isn't good yeah. that strength isn't good yeah. and to get to your point about yeah the trip hazards yeah. and the safety of their environment occupational yeah. therapy can be such a huge benefit mm -hmm. so um, you know don't be afraid to reach out Good. and right. we can yeah. work on getting yeah. help there and those physical therapists can do home evaluations yes. I yes. please make sure your yeah. home is well lit yeah and if you can do grab bars mm -hmm. make sure you know even raise toilets yeah, there's all type of little things that yeah. those physical therapists are yeah. great at pointing out that yeah. really helps safe keep these individuals that are higher risk. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is not just elderly people oh, either. Absolutely you know, not. Yes. Yes. Absolutely not. Any of us yeah. can, yes. can be that. So we have a caller from Sioux Falls who says, if I've had an endoscopy for swallowing problems, but nothing was found, what could be another cause of problems with swallowing? Sam? I have found many times untreated reflux can play a huge role. Sometimes they'll spot that on the endoscopy. And an endoscopy, for people that don't know, you you put a camera in the down into the stomach so they can take a peek at the structures. But sometimes I feel like it's it, it can also be coordination with the swallow mechanism. So they do make speech therapists, mm -hmm. you two know this, they make speech therapists that can do swallow studies, look at different textures that you're having difficulty with. They make beautiful studies, swallow studies that can show if there's any type of narrowing or discoordination within the swallow mechanism. So sometimes it can be multifaceted and there are things that if they didn't find anything, continue to advocate for themselves and see if there's something else going on there because that, that's scary and you don't want people having red choking. So that, that's the fear of difficulty with swallowing is something might get lodged in the wrong spot. So keep, keep persevering if even if that was normal, there might be something else they can look into. Yeah. Thoughts to add? Yeah, so I really love how she broke it down because it's like different mechanisms. So even from, you know, rolling the tongue and having mm -hmm. that bolus move. Mm -hmm. So people that have had a stroke could have difficulty wow, swallowing. Absolutely. People that have nervous uh, system issues, diseases. those that have Excellent muscular point. diseases. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, endoscopy looks down directly into where you swallow through, mm -hmm. but there could be pressure from outside. There could be a tumor. There could Thyroid. be other tests mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah. that could show that. So yeah, let mm -hmm. your doctor know. They start one work up if that doesn't help you know we will continue to investigate mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll get to the bottom of it yep. and yeah. this is this is a great reason yeah. to have a primary care doctor yeah. because mm -hmm. your GI doctor may just be eh, mm -hmm. nope mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. esophagus looks fine yeah. uh, and your primary care doctor your internist your yeah. family practice doctor yeah. is going to be thinking about those whole, other things. Yeah. So, uh, Sam, we have a caller from Sioux Falls who s wants to know she got all of her COVID vaccinations, she got her boosters, and gosh darn it, she still got COVID. Oh, why golly. is that? I know. I, I have a lot of patients that we address this with, and I honestly do wish I could say that getting your vaccines is going to prevent you from getting the disease. That is unfortunately not the case. We were hopeful. I know <laughs> we've all been waiting for that moment, but yeah. what the vaccines are meant to do is build up your immune system, kind of give them a red flag of, hey, this is what we're looking for. If we come across it, this is what we do. So it is unfortunate you still can get the virus. That That is 100% true. I wish it wasn't the case, but what that vaccine has done for you is remind your body and notify your body even ahead of some people getting the infection that, hey, this is what we're looking for. This is the response that we need to fight that virus. 
and hopefully the hope is that you do not have as rough mm -hmm. a medical course as mm -hmm. some people even before the vaccination came out so yeah. sorry about that yeah. <laughs> sorry caller but that yeah but shoot mm -hmm. the hope is and what yeah. we certainly have seen in reality yeah is far fewer people ending up mm -hmm. in the hospital yeah. mm -hmm. with COVID, far mm -hmm. few, fewer people ending dying. up on ventilators yeah. dying. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in that sense, the vaccine has been very mm -hmm. successful. Very successful. Mm -hmm. Not as successful as we dared hope. Indeed, <laughs> and, indeed. And I would just like to plug in that, you know, we've had vaccines for other things. Mm -hmm. And what we've told people in the past is that the aim is for you not to have severe mm -hmm. disease. So same as the flu vaccine, right? Some people still get the flu, but probably prevents them from being hospitalized with the flu. Mm -hmm. So just like Dr. Darnell has told us, you know, the aim is to get those soldiers in your body active, mm -hmm. ready, waiting, and then once they detect it, you know, they keep you all propped up, you fight it, you get over with it, and you can move on to the next thing. And you might okay. still be miserable. Yeah, I know. But if you can be miserable at I home know. and not miserable in the hospital, that's a win. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Yeah. We have someone from Esteline who says his skin is yellow and he has blood in his urine. He wonders mm -hmm. what could be causing this. Dr. Agaba. Yeah, so when, <laughs> Nothing when, you, good. <laughs> when, you, when you combine the two, I'm trying to think. So um, when the skin is yellow, typically we would call it jaundice. So mm -hmm. a lot of times it has to do with something in the liver. Um, sometimes that breakdown of what we call bilirubin, which is something that the liver breaks down, could be excreted in the urine. Mm -hmm. It could look very much it like blood. It could look absolutely. like blood, mm -hmm. you know? So the top thing to think about is probably the liver, and there are two things. The liver is not functioning, or somebody's actually bleeding somewhere and breaking down the blood products too quickly. So yeah, your urine would need to be tested, Mm -hmm. and possibly the blood just to make sure that the organs mm -hmm. are functioning. So I would say please go see someone. Yeah, yeah. Sooner, sooner rather than sooner later. Than later. As sooner as you rather can. than later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. discoloration yeah. in your skin yeah. or eyes yeah. is yeah. indicative of yeah. something pretty Serious. dangerous yeah. going on. So yeah, maybe even yeah. tomorrow, yeah. please yeah. call your primary. <laughs> 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 and if it's me, I'll see you in the clinic. <laughs> 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 Um, we have someone in Brookings, uh, oh, yeah. In Brookings this week, a sixth grader committed suicide. Mm. What as parents should we be looking for to help our kids during a crisis? Oh. As, uh, oh. That sixth grader. Yeah, I, I have no words for that. Mm. The, this is, mm. it goes back to that mental health thing. I mean, mm. and I, I tell all my kiddos when they're in for a well child check, and I address it to the parents too, these kids are growing up in a very different time than the majority of us, especially those of us sitting at this table, even mm -hmm. myself. So yeah. they have outside factors that we didn't run into, the social media, mm -hmm. television. I mean, they, they're just constantly bombarded by information and people stressing your body should look like this and you shouldn't do that. And so I mean, they, they're, that being said, very different time than us. So how do we help them cope? is, uh, man, I think the, the line of communication has got to stay open between the parents and the child. If you are seeing any type of behavior that is abnormal, some of them can become withdrawn. I know they used to tell us if they start giving things away that are super precious to them or they withdraw from their activities for unknown reasons, they're having panic attacks at school. Like the, this must be addressed right away. I, I, if you have to call, there's there's hotlines to call. You can go into triage in a clinic, in a hospital. If they have any inclination that's gonna happen, use your parent gut. You guys have that, yeah. I don't, but yeah. use your parent gut. If it's telling you something's wrong, it's correct. Yeah. It's correct, yeah. you know your children. Mm -hmm. There's a behavioral, herald, behavioral care, urgent care in Sioux yes. Falls, yes. which has um, oh, yes. you know, a a same day, same day mm -hmm. assessment. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is another one of those access issues where we don't have the counselors that we need. We don't have the the psychiatrists that we need. But um, there are the 800 number, the yeah. the suicide. crisis yeah. suicide hotline. Mm -hmm. That even if you're just not sure, it's okay to call that number. Oh, yes. um, and we need to think about removing access to those dangerous things. Yes. If you have guns in your home. Um, medications. And you, you, mm -hmm. Guns, medications, sharp objects. Mm -hmm. um, pay attention to those things. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to, to check on your kids frequently. Yeah. It is, if they say something, I mean, it sure could be a, an attention-seeking thing, but it, we have to take those things yeah. seriously. This is getting absolutely out of hand, and we're losing people we're losing and children people, have yeah. left and right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think particularly with young people, it's important to remember that you know, we're all adults and we have had many years of learning that there's tomorrow, mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. this horrible thing that has happened, um, we can get through and, yes. and kids are impulsive and they haven't had that. So we need mm -hmm. to be taking those steps forward to protect those kids mm -hmm. and to talk about it. Yes. And so, I mm -hmm. kind of feel, I know, like, Dr. Darnell said the big thing is communication um, with yeah. the family, mm -hmm. but sometimes just identifying someone else that they are able to confide 100%. in. 100%, yes. Um, in addition to noticing if they feel isolated. So it seems like even though social media tags people with so many friends, mm -hmm. just that feeling of being all alone, yes. I <laughs> think to a large extent. Because it's not the same no, kind of friendship no. nope. that yeah. they develop. Yeah. up and yeah, in person mm -hmm. the 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 number the crisis mm -hmm. number is 988 okay. for those viewers who okay. aren't aware of that mm -hmm. so um, we oh okay so we have a caller from Brookings uh, who wants to thank us for talking about mental health and was wondering if we could talk some more about local resources mm -hmm. Um, of course, we've yeah. all East River here, yeah. but three different communities. Mm -hmm. um, the state of South Dakota does have uh, community mental health centers in various communities around the the state. Uh, here, it was previously called East Central Behavioral Health. Mm -hmm. Now it has a new name, it was the Ivy Center, and I'm blanking on the name that it has currently, but if you look that up in your phone book, yeah. um, that's a sliding scale. I know there's... There's um, the Vera Behavioral Health Care mm -hmm. System, and that almost goes through all the age groups. So yes. we do have, you know, childhood, adolescent, we have the adult, and then we have the senior center, mm -hmm. all in one building now. And you did talk about the mental health, um, like the urgent acute, care. Yep. And yep. there is like a, a collaboration, I think it's called The Links also, mm -hmm. which is, oh, and yes. yeah, and mm -hmm. yeah, so there are a bunch of things. And there are addiction centers also. Yes. So those things tie hand in hand, yes, you know, like the detox and all that, like just finding a way around them. So there are facilities. Mm -hmm. And yes, a, a lot of um, jobs have like support groups or like counseling groups, things like that, that you and should be able to access, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, it's also important to recognize that a lot of employers have mm -hmm. yes. employee assistance yes. programs yes. Yes, that can get you a few yeah. sessions with a yeah. counselor to kind yeah. of get you started. Mm -hmm. And your primary care doctor is usually Definitely. a great resource yeah. Yeah. Uh, for helping you figure out what your resources are yeah, in absolutely. your area. Absolutely. Unfortunately, it's, again, not easy to get in with a counselor, even yeah. with the help of your primary care yeah. doctor. Mm -hmm. Your primary care doctor may be able to start medication for you too. And listen. And listen. Mm. And listen. Oh, and listen. Yeah. Yes. Novel. Exactly. So we have, um, all right, a question here. Let's, uh, George from email wants to talk a little bit about lifestyle and holistic medicine to be empowered to live fully alive in mind, body, and spirit, which I think is a good tie-in to some of that that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Sam, what's what's your take on that? Yeah, you, you said it so beautifully, looking at the whole yeah. patient. I mean, yeah. and in, in my personal experience, I did try to go to a doctor of osteopathic medicine because they do have a little bit more 
holistic approach. They can do kind of light manipulations and mm -hmm. things like that of the body to help with overall alignment and function, which didn't work out, but that's I still very much believe in that and really wish I had that in my practice. But I think there's a lot to be said by going off of what our body is telling us. Mm -hmm. Are we iron deficient? Are we hurting somewhere? Obviously, maybe the alignment is off and we need to go to physical therapy. Many clinics do a really good job of tying that all together. We have access to both mental health counselors. We have physical therapy. We've got meds we can provide. Some, some communities, including Watertown, do have a functional medicine clinic. Yeah. They absolutely have a place in the medical world. They take a step back and can look at things a little bit more holistically. They do, do some prescribing as well. M many of it is extra vitamins and minerals, the things people might be lacking. But, uh, and we've got to, this whole entire country world needs to work on increasing our activity levels. I know Rick is saying absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Motion is lotion. All oh, indeed. Really. And, indeed. And nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, looking yeah. at oh, nutrition, yeah. that's yeah. such an important yeah. thing, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful mm -hmm. yes. introduction <laughs> to our little video clip yes. here. The medical field includes clinicians with many different skill sets to help people. Dietitians are an often underappreciated but very important part of the team. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer spoke with registered dietitian Katie Vanderwall about how she helps her patients. Katie Vanderwall is a registered dietitian for Brookings Health System. A registered dietitian is a health professional who can work in a variety of different areas, who realistically teaches health and nutrition concepts to people to help them improve their lifestyle. Vanderwall helps with educating patients on food groups and talking about what they're eating currently. We go through all food groups, we go through, you know, what does that plate look like? And I kind of help people come up with ideas. I don't always necessarily lay out a menu for patients. A registered dietitian visits all age ranges about diets, but they can also help with disease management. So you're going to come to see the dietitian if you're diagnosed with something like diabetes, a food allergy, a gluten intolerance, celiac disease. My job is going to be then to educate you on the nutritional aspects of how to manage that disease and how you really to live a good life in the world of nutrition and still be able to enjoy food on a regular basis. Registered dietitians are commonly confused with nutritionists and Vanderwall says they are not the same profession. Dietitians go through four years of undergraduate school, an accredited internship, sometimes have a master's degree, and take an exam to get the registered dietitian title, where nutritionists... A nutritionist doesn't necessarily have that same educational background. They might be able to offer something in a different aspect, but there are laws about where each person can work. For example, in healthcare, you need to be a registered dietitian to be able to work in a healthcare facility. A licensed nutritionist might be somebody that might be working at a gym or something in another aspect. Overall, Vanderbilt says a dietitian offers and teaches anyone who has questions about food, no matter what situation somebody is in. If you come in to see me and you have a disease you're trying to manage, but maybe you're on a program like food stamps or WIC or something of that sort, the foods you get are very specific from that program. So my job is to then help you say, okay, first I'm gonna educate you on how to manage this disease or this situation that you have. And then from there, we're gonna say, okay, these are the foods you get. How can I incorporate those into your you know, menu or meal plan that we've been talking about? And then how can you use supplemental income to buy the stuff in between? I love nutritionists. I love my dietitians. They are so helpful at helping people make changes, yeah. even small changes that yeah. can make a big difference yeah, for their health in the yeah. long run. Yeah. And uh, that's what we should all be aiming for is to promote that overall well-being. Yeah. So thank you, Katie, and thank you all the other dietitians out there. So we've got lots more questions to look at here. We have a caller from Sioux Falls. This is a good question. This is a, a very valid point. How do they come up with the number of people with COVID when not all cases are documented because people are testing at home? 
What do you ladies have to say about that? <laughs> um, so yeah, a lot of statistics um, you could extrapolate. So there are like regression studies that you start off with and then uh, you talk about prevalence, you talk about you know, fatality versus incidents, which are the new cases. I do hear you totally that they probably did not count every single person, but sometimes figuring out how many test kits went out, you know, who comes back, something like that could be helpful. In the past, we had gone ahead and reconfirmed with testing in the clinic, so that kind of gave us that, like, average ratio of the population that is affected. But now we know that when we have waves, you know, people show up maybe in the ICU, show up in the emergency room, you know, and we have an estimate of different times of the waves. But we can say it's 100% accurate. Yeah. It will just be a projection. It's, it's just our yeah. best guess. It's You're a, absolutely yeah. right. It's a and, and my best guess is there's a lot of it out there. Right so. now. Yeah, we have a caller um, who is, uh, where was this? <laughs> uh, the bottom line was that the individual is an older person and has had trouble with vaccines in the past, has had allergy issues with vaccines in the past. And what should they expect going into this COVID and flu season uh, since they don't feel that they can get the booster or the flu shot? Sam. Yeah, that, that's that's tough. I. I, I try to tell my patients, in, even if there are ingredients in these shots that you may have a response to, how little amount there is in there probably is not gonna cause anything catastrophic. You may feel the effects of it. And frankly, I, I tell people, if you have a huge concern about it, please go on and read the active ingredient list and even the inactive ingredient list. And if you have concerns, bring them up to us specifically there might be testing out there for it. I know plenty of allergists out there, and I, I guess I don't know how specific they get on some of those little minutia in the vaccines, but of course, I heavily encourage vaccines regardless, unless of course it was a really bad response like anaphylaxis. Like yeah. yeah, clearly that is an indicator. Contraindication, 100%. For that mm -hmm. particular for vaccine. That vaccine. For that Vaccines vaccine. are mm -hmm. not all the same. Correct. So yes. there's mm -hmm. a brand new, well, it's, I guess it's not brand new, but there is a new COVID vaccine mm -hmm. out now mm -hmm. uh, that is unrelated to the previous three vaccines that we've had in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So you may be able to mm -hmm. get a vaccine uh, even if you've had problems in the past with it. It's definitely something to sit down and talk yeah. with your doctor yeah. about. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Um, we have someone uh, who is wondering about sarcoidosis and how, specifically sarcoidosis of the heart causing complete heart block mm -hmm. and wondering about pacemakers causing heart failure. This is a good internal medicine <laughs> question, Dr. Agaba. <laughs> so I kind of feel like they're two different things, but I'm probably wrong. So yes, there can be sarcoidosis of the heart. Sarcoidosis overall is kind of rare. What is sarcoidosis? So sarcoidosis, um, it, it is uh, what we call a granulomatous disease, which means that you could have growths in certain parts of the body and different places. The commonest commonly is, you know, uh, around the lymph nodes in between the lungs. That typically is the easiest to detect, maybe on a chest x-ray or something like that. And then they can do a biopsy and verify, you know, what those cells look like. And it's the normal tissue has been replaced by, by these abnormal by tissues. By the abnormal tissues that grow in yeah. the places where they shouldn't be. Yeah. So yes, if someone has sarcoidosis in the heart, the way that the heart works is almost like electricity. So it conducts from one place to the other. Imagine something blocking that. So yes, the person can have a heart block. And yes, there is treatment. Typically, treatment for heart block is the pacemaker. So it, it feels a little, you know, disjoint. Like maybe to there me. was something lost yeah. in translation. Yeah. So, so yes, the person with sarcoidosis may end up with a pacemaker. 
if someone has persistent heart block, then their heart may not contract the way it should, and they may end up with heart failure. So the absence probably of a pacemaker when they need it could result in the heart failure and not the pacemaker causing it. But you know, it's something to still talk to whoever proposed it. If your cardiologist suggested it or your primary doctor, just go back and talk with them a little more and understand the details. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so our next question, uh, someone from Aberdeen who has rosacea, and uh, that's a frustrating illness, and they are wondering what causes it and what treatments are available. Sam. Yeah. Oh, I, I have lots of patients that struggle with uh, numerous types of skin issues, yeah. but rosacea is actually a lot more common than I thought originally. It's actually an infection. It's actually like infection on your skin and it, it tends to cause kind of a red, like ro I probably am right now too, but <laughs> kind of a red rosy discoloration on the skin. And there are topical treatments. It kind of depends on the severity. There are topical options and there also are oral options depending on the severity. But if that's something that you're questioning or you think you might have, have your primary doc look at it. If it's too hard to treat, they do make wonderful dermatologists out there that can also be of <laughs> assistance be to us. To so, us. but I mean, you're right, Deb. It's it's very challenging and very frustrating for people to live with. And, and it's a chronic condition. It is. So, it is. It does yeah. relapse and remit yeah. on its yeah. sometimes on its own. Yeah. Good question. We have a question that came in via email about the best treatment for spinal stenosis. This person has tried PT and steroid shots aren't working. Uh, they've been on prednisone and it's getting to be too much, which of course prednisone is. We don't like to keep people on yeah. prednisone by mouth or by shots over and over again. Mm -hmm. Dr. Agaba. Yeah, so that is a tough one. Yeah, because you have started from all the common things that we do. And then the next thing is it depends on the location. It depends on the side effects you're getting. Um, typically, you know, you would start off with maybe a general orthopedic doctor, that's the bone doctor, and then sometimes you would have to talk to the spine doctor. Um, in addition to the prednisone shots, sometimes there are other shots that people could get. Sometimes there are other processes like ablation, different things that could kind of numb uh, that area. Ultimately, some people that have some level of deformity may end up needing surgery, yes. but you know, that's a conversation ongoing with your provider. Yeah. yeah. Your experts. Yeah. Um, here's a kind of a specialized question. We'll do what we can in a, in a brief <laughs> minute here. Um, someone orally taking estrogen for transition, um, wondering about whether it's better to take orally or sublingually. Wow, that formulation this, this is one, uncommon. This one might be the yeah. Stump the Prairie Doc question yeah. Yeah. for the night. I, mean, I guess initial yeah. was, I mean, they're both absorbed either buccally yeah, or but systemically. I don't know but that I have there's a heard. lot of good yeah. data about sublingual. absorption for yeah. sublingual. Yeah. So yeah. my instinct is to say um, oral, oral, patch. oral mm -hmm. or patches, mm -hmm. but even more talk with your yeah. endocrinologist yeah. who's helping yeah. you with your transition yes. because Absolutely. they know a whole lot more about the That's details <laughs> than the true. three of us yeah. do. Indeed. So yeah. I think a good I, question. Yeah. I, th I think you won your, your <laughs> I think I think you won the stop the doctor <laughs> so yeah. and here's a very um, a good point that I think all of us doctors should should keep in mind a caller from Redfield just commenting that she appreciates doctors who take the time to listen to their older patients um, and listen to their concerns and complaints and use them as clues to gather an overall picture of what's going on rather than assuming they know what's going on and just jumping to an early diagnosis mm -hmm. without the full picture and that is always a good reminder. Yeah, so, here we have an individual, this question came in via email, uh, who fell and they had their, a blood clot in their ankle three months ago and it took a long time to go away. Should they still be worried? Comfort. Oh, so I'm trying to differentiate. Did they have a blood clot or a collection is, of blood? That is a very yeah. good question. Yeah. Exactly what yeah. they mean by that. Okay. So, so we don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So typically, if you have a collection of blood, we call that a hematoma, which is like you injure yourself and then you bleed under the skin. And typically, that would reabsorb on its that own. It can be very slow. It mm, could take a very. long time. Mm -hmm. The other one that you talked about, the blood clot, 
typically you would need a blood thinner. So I don't think you had a blood clot. I would think you bled under the skin. And yeah, you may remain black and blue for a little bit. And it, it can yeah. stain. You yeah. can get that hemocytorin yeah. deposits yeah. that yeah. can last Eventually, it, yeah. it for, forever. <laughs> for so, some time. Yes. Yeah. So that would be um, some clarity from your regular doctor yeah. about yeah. what that was. Here is um, an anonymous caller. Why is it so hard to find information on congestive heart failure in South Dakota doctor's offices and what are some good resources for the elderly who are concerned about oh, it. Interesting. Sam. Well, first of all, I want to say sorry to yeah. whomever yeah. that was. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, we're, primaries are a pretty good place to start with mm -hmm. that. I mean, I, I love to educate patients. That gives them everything that hopefully they can use to optimize their health. And, but heart failure is a very, very challenging disease to manage. You can get too dry, too much fluid. Now your blood pressure is low. So I, I can imagine now how your frustrating. Are oh, stressed. I can imagine how frustrating that has to be. We know off the top of our head what that means and yeah. what to do about it. But please reach out. I would imagine online there's probably there's an American car, like cardiac association that might have a really good page. American Heart Association. I like to, probably does. I like to recommend medlineplus.gov, yes. which is a search engine of medically vetted sites like yes. the sites that you are yeah, American asking Heart for. Association has a great page, but, but if start with one of us. If you can't find yeah. what you need, please, yeah. please continue to ask. Okay. That's so important that you understand that disease process. Yeah, it's tough. We have several more questions in just a few more minutes, yeah, so we want to be quick Short here. Sweet. Short and sweet, ladies. We're not very good at that, I can see. <laughs> Uh, here is a caller whose husband was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's. He's only 69. He was given a prescription for Carvedopa Levodopa. No tremors, just stiffness and balance issues. What will the future be like and any exercises or physical therapy? Exercise and physical therapy always, always helpful. Uh, future we cannot predict, so everyone so is varied. different. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and the last thing, yes, yeah, sometimes doses need to change. Sometimes medications need to change. Sometimes people, you know, survive, become functional, yeah. but physical therapy. And there's, there's actually yeah. a specific physical therapy for, for Parkinson's, the Parkinson's called the Big and Loud Program. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's wonderful. wonderful. Talk to your neurologist okay. or your doctor mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. We have a caller from Winter who wants to know the cause of dementia and research being done on what causes dementia or treatments for dementia. That's a big question. Ooh. And That's a very big we've question. done a dementia show oh, within okay. the last uh, year or two. Okay. So that's a good resource. Okay. Quick, quick answer there. Um, so dementia, various causes. Dementia just means basically you're losing most of your memory and functional status. A lot of it age related. Um, they talk about plaques, which are deposits sometimes in the brain. There are different grades of them, different um, ways you classify based on the different things that happen along. I know you're thinking Alzheimer's, that's not the only one. There is like vascular strokes. from a stroke, mm -hmm. you know, prior strokes. So there are many things. So yeah, for now, just keep your brain active. You know, we talk about good, good nutrition, nutrition good exercise. exercise. Yeah. And those, research. Uh, Always ongoing. Yeah. Right. Here's, here's a good question. We got a fever when they were sick with COVID, mm -hmm. 102, and it was miserable. Is it better to let the body fight with the fever or bring the fever down with Tylenol? Sam, what do you tell people? Such a good question. I tell people the fever is the response that your body is producing to fight whatever infection it is producing. But uncomfortable, absolutely, absolutely, especially in children, I'm like, oh, it is not a terrible idea to treat it, especially if the child doesn't want to eat. However, is it hurtful to you? Not necessarily, unless it gets sky high. I usually say 104 or higher is probably an ER visit or a clinic visit at least. But as adults, I mean, if you can ride it out, fine, but it is pretty uncomfortable. You know <laughs> It, it may shorten the illness a little yeah. bit, but I don't want to be miserable. Yeah. I take the time. Not at all. I would too. Yes, I would still too. Totally fine. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, an individual started on CPAP, and th as they've increased their nightly uses, they are sleeping 10 hours a night, and they're worried that this is too much. They had COVID the last week of April and have been more tired since. Do you think the COVID combined with the CPAP would make me sleep longer? So, well, most people start off from having 
lack of sleep right before they start the CPAP. So sometimes it's catch up sleep. So not because, you know, it's bad for you, but yes, definitely you need to also recover from COVID. So yes, probably a combination of I the think. two. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. mm -hmm. The CPAP is good though. Don't yes. quit your CPAP. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Sure. Someone from Rapid City says there's been a big push about the shingles vaccine and they're wondering why we're so concerned about the shingles vaccine um, and what causes shingles. Sam. <laughs> Shingles is actually like a zoster. It's a it's a virus, and any of us that have had chicken, chicken pox, pox, most of us have. We didn't have that fancy vaccine that we have now. If you've had chicken pox, it's a virus that lives in a ner in the nerves in your back. And when you go undergo stress, you're ill with COVID. It's going to crop out, and it's going to show up on a nerve distribution on your body, which is very uncomfortable. The reason we love the shingle shot is it just like any other vaccine. Hopefully, reduces the severity of your illness. If you think you're getting it, please notify your doctor especially if it involves your eyes in any way, shape, or form, that is your an emergency. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so please notify us. But the whole point is you don't want to get a severe disease. You can have long-lasting pain from it. And if it involves an area in your body, it can really be detrimental to your long-term health. So that's why we love Shingrick shots. Shot. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the big reason for the push is that there is it's a shingle shot that is new, that is far more yeah. effective, yes. uh, and it's mm -hmm. not a live virus vaccine, mm -hmm. so more people mm -hmm. are eligible for it. And That's you don't wonderful. want shingles, get your shingles mm -hmm. shot. So typically from age of 50, two shots, two to six months apart. apart. Mm -hmm. Yes, Thank you. exactly. <laughs> Very good. As opposed to the original one, which was, was one, one shot, shot. Uh, oh. but wasn't nearly as effective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So wonderful. Um, so quick one last thing hands always dry cracked and bleeding in the winter never mind i'm told we're out of time oh, lots shoot. of lotion shoot, and yeah. talk with your doctor if it's yeah. not helping is the mm -hmm. answer mm -hmm. the winner of our prize tonight is brian from aberdeen thank you everybody for calling in thank you brian for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show a gift will be sent to you and we'll be back after this Listen today to the Prairie Doc Podcast, a weekly show hosted by Laura Ellsworth, as she talks with medical professionals, takes questions, and walks us through important health topics affecting those in our communities. Search for Prairie Doc on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and wherever you find your favorite podcast today. Recently, while visiting from out of state, my father had a health hiccup. As we navigated getting this problem investigated and addressed, he was very concerned that we keep his primary care doctor informed. As my dad has said repeatedly, I give him more grief than any of my other doctors, but I also listen to him more than any of my other doctors. He's the only one looking out for all of me. Like many Americans, particularly older Americans, my dad has a whole host of specialists that he sees on a regular basis. One of my friends recently teased me, what do you primary care providers do anyway? It seems like there's a specialist for pretty much any problem you can imagine. If I see a cardiologist, an electrophysiologist, a urologist, an endocrinologist, a gastroenterologist, a rheumatologist, a nephrologist, and maybe even an oncologist, why do I need one more doctor who doesn't seem to be handling anything anyway? Established viewers of this show know that I, like Dr. Holm before me, am a proponent of the annual wellness visit. It's a chance to step back and look at the big picture to review screenings, immunizations, and health promotion recommendations. Many factors can influence those recommendations beyond age and gender. Did you know that older men who have smoked ever should be screened for aortic aneurysms, and that diabetes in pregnancy increases the risk of diabetes in the future. The origin of a symptom is not always straightforward. For example, abdominal pain can originate not just from the digestive system, but from many other systems and from causes that might surprise you, such as blood or metabolic diseases, poisonings, 
migraines. Some people, women especially, get their gallbladders removed only to discover that the problem was, in fact, their heart. A primary care doctor can help sort things out in the most efficient way. A primary care doctor looks at the big picture. In fact, all of us answering questions tonight are primary care doctors. We commonly say that we are specialties of breadth, not depth. My father says the specialist studies one 1,000 page book on their topic, while the generalist studies the 10 page summary for 100 different topics. We may ask for assistance from our specialist colleagues for more unusual, treatment resistant or advanced diseases, but every day we help patients manage routine health problems. We coordinate care between specialists and watch for signs that the treatment for one problem is worsening another. In fact, I would argue that the more specialists you have, the more important that having someone looking out for all of you becomes. Everyone deserves a primary care provider. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Agaba and Dr. Darnell, for volunteering their time to help us answer all of our viewer questions this evening. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and online. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc on Call, wherever you get your podcasts. So, from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, thank you for joining us for another episode of health information based on science and built on trust. Until next time, stay, stay healthy, healthy out, out there, there people. people. Heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. Thinking heart disease only occurs at an older age is both untrue and dangerous to your health. Rhythm and flow, understanding the cardiovascular system. Next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Having access to trusted public health information is essential for thriving communities across South Dakota. As Americans, we all value the ability to make appropriate decisions about our health care. To do so, we need access to quality information from reliable sources. The Prairie Docs and their guests have been providing such information based on science and built on trust for the past 20 seasons. Hello, I'm Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, and I serve on the volunteer board of directors for the Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3 founded by Rick and Joni Holm. As we move into our 21st season of Prairie Doc programming, Board members, doctors, and volunteers continue to follow our mission to enhance health and diminish suffering by communicating useful information based on honest science and provided in a respectful and compassionate manner. Your donation to support Prairie Dog programming makes an extraordinary difference in fulfilling this important mission. Your generosity helps strengthen the Healing Words Foundation and expand the reach of trusted healthcare providers to share important health information that empowers individuals and families to make the decisions that are right for them. Donations from individuals comprise 50% of the funds generated by the Foundation to support Prairie Dog programming, and gifts of any size serve to enhance its impact. Please consider a personal or corporate gift today just go to prairiedoc.org to donate. Should you prefer not to donate online, please reach out to us by email and Foundation staff will follow up with you about a pledge. Many thanks for supporting the mission of the Healing Words Foundation and Prairie Doc Programming in South Dakota and throughout our region.
Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... At Avera, our nationally recognized health system will be right here with you, with care and coverage. Hello, possibility. Hello, healthy. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, the Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, the Peer District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications.